Hi folks. So my name is Jonathan Coleman. I'm the Professor of Chemical Physics and the Head of the School of Physics here in Trinity. And I have the very pleasant task of welcoming you all here today. Now before I say that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the, the masking rules. Everyone in the audience has to wear their masks, while the people up here, so long as we're two meters apart and two meters away from you guys, don't. Okay, so it's not like we're, we're breaking the rules. So that unpleasantness behind us, welcome to you all. Welcome to the School of Physics. And I want to particularly uh, welcome His Excellency, Thomas Davis, the Ambassador of Austria. And I want to thank you for your, all your support and support of the embassy uh, for the show of your lecture series. Um, Welcome to you all, and welcome to the, anyone, any of the Trinity professors, officers, and indeed the Dias community that are here today. So this is, believe it or believe it not, this is the 25th annual Stroger Lecture. I cannot believe that we're at 25 already. It's amazing. And it's, it's got to 25 because it's really been so, so successful. So we've always had these lectures here in this room, the Schrodinger Lecture Theatre, and it's called that because in 1943, Schrodinger gave his famous What Is Life lecture series here. Well, he gave at least the first lecture in this room, but I think it may have been moved up to the exam hall because the attendances were so large. So he was at least here for, for one lecture. So that was a very important thing. It led to the What Is Life book. And then that was credited by both Crick and Watson as inspiring their early work. So it also, uh, his lecture made a very big impression on, on Trinity College Dublin, so much so that they are still considering whether or not to offer him an academic position here in Trinity. <laughs> so that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Professor John Gould, who's going to give the scientific instructions. Marcus studied physics and philosophy in Munich, and then he told me this evening actually did his PhD in the field of material science. After that, he moved on to fundamental physics to the group of Anton Zeilinger, who of course is a super famous uh, quantum experimentalist. Um, and he basically stayed in Vienna, um, working at various different ranks, up to where he is today which is the director of the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information in the Austrian Academy of Sciences and professor in the University of Vienna. Uh, Marcus has won numerous prizes, um, too many for me to actually uh, explain today. Um, his group um, works currently on foundations of, of quantum mechanics, um, and in particular, Marcus is a world expert in the field of um, in the field of, 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 of quantum um, optomechanics and quantum optics. Um, so I first heard of his work uh, from a colleague of, um, of mine called Mauro Paternostro, who once worked in Marcus's group. Um, and it, he told me of these wonderful experiments in the field of optomechanics, which is some of the largest um, objects that we know that display coherent quantum behavior. Um, before I hand you over to Marcus, just an interesting bit of trivia is that Marcus just informed me tonight that his office in Vienna contains Schrodinger's uh, desk. <laughs> so Marcus, thank you very much. Thanks. So this, this is my claim to fame. <laughs> So um, in continuation what John just said, um, my office does not only contain the Schrodinger's desk that he had when he came back to Vienna, um, my office is also on the fourth floor of Boltzmann Gasse, um, which is the floor where, where Schrodinger's office was. It, it was. It's right next to the old office of Schrodinger, and it's also right next to the library where the um, letter um, uh, letters of Schrodinger, so the whole correspondence of Schrodinger is kept. And so every now and then you can um, simply walk over and um, you can read a little into the conversations um, because they're keeping both the letters that Schrodinger received and also copies of the letters that he sent. 
And so recently, I came across um, the following letter that was written by Albert Einstein from America um, in August 35, and I don't know, maybe received by Schrodinger and read by Schrodinger on November 25th, who knows, <laughs> around that time. Actually, I tried to find out how long letters it would take at that time from the US to Europe, but I could not find it easily. So here's the, here's the letter, here's a, the beginning. It starts with, Dear Schrödinger, this is the, um, up there. Uh, I translate, okay, because it's written in German. You are, in fact, the only human with whom I really like to discuss. Almost all the guys do not see the theory from the facts, but only the facts from the theory. They cannot get out of the once assumed concept net, but only fidget around in it. But you look at it as you wish, from the outside and from the inside. However, um, we are sharpest opposites in the conception of the way to be expected. What he means with the way to be expected was, essentially, what to do about the wave function, what to do about this object in quantum physics that somehow refers to the world outside. So the rest of the letter deals essentially um, with this core issue, or one of these core issues that uh, still concern us today in modern quantum physics. Right? It deals with the struggle to understand what quantum physics actually says about the world. Or in other words, um, what the wave function in quantum physics actually refers to outside, to the, in, in the outside world. And this discussion, in particular uh, in this letter, uh, culminated um, in the famous thought experiment that you all know of Schrodinger's cat. And I give you here um, a harmless quantum optics version of it. So what, what, is, what is it about? I'm pretty sure you heard about it. Um, the point is that quantum physics allows for experiments whose outcome contradicts the assumption that a system is either in one state or another state. So for example, like the location of a photon behind a beam splitter, a glass plate. Yeah? So we, as quantum physicists, speak then of a quantum superposition. And we say somewhat loosely that both states are realized simultaneously. Uh, so the photon takes both paths. So this is our way of loosely speaking about a superposition. But what we actually mean is when we say that statement that we can perform an experiment whose outcome contradicts the assumption that the photon was either in this part or the other part. And since this is a very long sentence, we just say, well, the photon took both parts and say it's a quantum superposition. Okay, what, we, what we actually mean is this very long sentence. So couple this now with, in Schrodinger's words, uh, uh, an evil device, okay, like here, our, uh, what, what is depicted here on the slide, then you get a state in nature where the cat is simultaneously alive and dead. Hmm? But um, again, what we mean by that when we say it is there exists an experiment whose outcome is in contradiction with the assumption that the cat is either alive or dead. And since we're too lazy to say the sentence out loud, we just say the cat is dead and alive, and it's a quantum feature. So in this letter that I showed you, Einstein has made his uneasiness about this here very, very clear. So he says, I quote here from the letter, from, from the second part of the letter, by no art of interpretation can this psi function that describes this state in nature be made an adequate description of the real factual situation. He goes on in the letter, he says, because in reality there is no such thing as being both dead and alive. So regardless of how bizarre or, again, in Schrodinger's words, burlesque, yeah, this situation may seem to us, 
modern quantum experiments with single particles, we can conduct them, they show that these predictions of quantum physics that arise from the existence of such states are correct. And a well-known example that I, that I show here um, um, are the experiments of my Vienna colleagues, Markus Arndt and Anton Zeilinger, who have shown that a molecule here on the left, coming in from the, coming in from the left, behaves in an experiment as if it would take both possible paths to the upper slit or the lower slit at the same time. Or again, I say it again because it's really important to remember to you when we say that the molecule seems to take both parts at the same time. What we mean is we get an experimental outcome, which is here so-called interference fringes. You see this wave-like pattern. If you repeat this experiment many times, you get this, get, get this wave-like pattern. And this wave-like pattern, the so-called interference pattern, is in direct contradiction with the very assumption that the molecule took either the upper path or the lower path. The way we checked it in an experiment is we would close one and would see where the molecule uh, comes. We would close the other one, would see where the molecule comes. And if the two, if you'd add up the two possible um, uh, paths and possible outcomes, they, they, these two don't add up to this pattern. So this pattern contradicts the assumption that the molecule either went one way or the other way. This is what we call, uh, this is why we say it took both paths. So the experimental proof, in essence, of the quantum superposition for even larger objects, like molecules and even larger and larger, confronts us now with, um, I guess, one of the greatest intellectual and philosophical challenges. Namely, how is a worldview possible free of contradictions against the background now of our learned insights, what states are allowed in nature by quantum physics. How can we conceive, how, we can, how can we come up with a worldview that is free of logical inconsistencies? Fact is, and I showed you one example, that these states, these superposition states, are part of our experimentally accessible world, huh? a part of our experience, full stop. We cannot <laughs> simply ignore that. So now you know the essentials of quantum physics, just in case you haven't known it, but you seem to be already quite familiar with them. So I told you everything you need to know about quantum physics. Yeah? So now let's ask, let, let, let's see, our knowledge on gravity. Uh, that's, that's to the same. Well, so what about gravity? What do we know about gravity? Well, um, first of all, Einstein's general theory of relativity is the most successful theory so far to describe phenomena of gravitation. Um, what's different from Newton's view is that the force in, in, in quotation marks is now replaced by the motion in a curved space-time. Okay? So a large mass bends space-time, and a smaller test mass, we call it, essentially um, moves in the curved space, uh, which we then perceive as if there would be a force um, attracting the smaller object to the larger. Okay? And it turns out that even light rays follow this metric of curved space. Uh, so... Um, Historically, we have here the successful experimental confirmation of Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity um, uh, by, um, by Eddington with the famous solar eclipse experiments. And that culminated a um, hundred years later into, in these spectacular images of uh, light deflection by a black hole. Uh, so it's safe. We know that gravity works. And no less spectacular, just to remind you of all the success over the last decade, essentially, um, was the groundbreaking experimental confirmation of gravitational waves using these kilometer-long baseline um, laser-based interferometers, LIGO and VIRGO in the US and in Europe. So laser interferometric gravitational wave observatory. 
Furthermore, even clocks and quantum systems are not spared by gravitational phenomena. Yeah, so I, I'm really sure you heard that already. So clocks tick differently um, at different heights of the gravitational field. We know that. Yeah, which, um, th and this effect must be taken into account when you build a navigation system such as GPS. Okay? Uh, for me, a particularly impressive example is actually the following experiment. This is by a research group led by Dave Vineland in the US. What they have shown is um, how the frequency of an atomic clock that they build on this optical table here um, changes when they lift the table on which the experiment is built by 30 centimeters. So this is, this is what you see here. So they measure a certain frequency, and then they just lift the table by 30 centimeters, so just by that, and you see that the, the clock rate changes. And if you want to keep up with the literature, only a couple of weeks ago there was an amazing um, experimental manuscript. There is a result reported by the group of Chun Yi, also in Boulder, where this experiment was made, where they see gravitational phenomena at a, of, of that type on a length scale of a millimeter. Yeah? So, and even as early as the 70s, researchers led by Sam Werner um, were able to show that Earth's gravitational field would also influence the wave packet of a neutron. And today this effect, um, where um, uh, the, the, the quantum mechanical wave packet of a massive particle, like a neutron or an atom, is being used in atom interferometers to measure very tiny gravitational effects uh, in Earth's gravitational field, for example. So, let's summarize. We know that general relativity works. We have a working theory of gravity. Quantum theory works too. To this day, we don't have a single experiment that would contradict the predictions of either of um, uh, these two theories. So, <laughs> the obvious question is, where is the problem? Uh, and this is what the rest of the lecture will be about. The problem is that both theories rest on worldviews that are mutually exclusive. So each of the theory is built on a worldview that essentially excludes the worldview that the other theory is built on. This brings me back to our skier. We don't have a consistent worldview um, on which our two theories are built on. Gravitational theory doesn't know about the superposition principle that we just had before. And quantum theory cannot live with a space-time that is fixed regardless of the role of the observer. So in other words, if quantum theory is correct, then we must radically rethink our concept of space and time as is given right now by, the, by, the, by our theory of gravity. On the other hand, if general relativity is correct, we must radically rethink the role of quantum theory for the description of our world. So we have the possibility to quantize gravity or to gravitize quantum physics, yeah, to use um, Roger Penrose's words. And I put here two quotes that I'm pretty sure you already read by now um, uh, of two people who I would consider to be proponents for each of these views. And now what I just said, this discrepancy, this is, believe it or not, an experimental problem. Okay? There is no experiment today that would answer the question whether gravity actually requires a quantum description. We simply don't know. Of course, we can just take our tools of theoretical physics. We can write down a quantum theory of gravity. People are doing that. There are many quantum theories of gravity out there. But we don't know whether nature cares. We simply don't know whether gravity requires a quantum description. What we need is experiments to tell us if this is true. And maybe these experiments could even lead away then to um, the correct description. 
So let's start with the first. No, maybe I should I, I should um, I should say something um, uh, before. Um, so let, let's let's do it. So if you think now of experiments, let's do it, let's do it like that. So if you think now of experiments, um, let's take the following: What if we can now take a quantum system and make it so heavy that it generates a gravitational field on its own? We call it a source mass. Yeah, it, it's a, 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 a mass that sources the gravitational field, that bends space-time in which then another smaller mass would actually then move. Okay? Then, if, if this were possible, we could measure the gravitational field of a quantum object okay? and basically directly investigate whether a quantum superposition of the gravitational, uh, 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 the, the, whether a quantum superposition applies also to gravitational fields or to the space-time metric, so to say. Okay? So, question, can space-time be produced in a superposition? So can we perform an experiment? So now again, remember what that means. Uh, can we perform an experiment whose outcome is in contradiction with the assumption that space-time always has either this value or that value? Okay? This is the question. So this question... I just tell you an historical anecdote has already been asked by Richard Feynman, for example, in the 1950s. Um, but in, at that time, it was clear there was no prospect whatsoever for an experimental realization. So I quote here Feynman, I, I, I put a note here. So Feynman said, one serious difficulty is the lack of experiments. Furthermore, we are not going to get any experiments. So we have to take a few points of how to deal with problems where no experiments are available. And then he basically um, praises the added value of Gedanken experiments and so on and so on. But today, more than 60 years later, after this sentence was written or spoken, we know how such an experiment could look like. And this is what I would like to tell you about. So what we need are quantum superpositions of large objects so objects large enough to generate a measurable gravitational field. This is now our challenge. Okay? You need to tell me how to do that. I will, I will assist you, but this will be our challenge now. How to produce um, quantum superpositions of objects large enough to generate a measurable gravitational field. So to do this, my team and I asked ourselves the following two questions. Yeah? So first of all, how small can we actually make a mass and still measure its gravitational field? Uh, this is one of the experimental challenges. So in other words, um, how well can I isolate gravity as a coupling force between objects? Because, you know, we have all these other interactions, electromagnetic interactions, which are much stronger than gravity. So can I experimentally at all conceive of or build an experiment where gravity of such a small object, because I think a quantum object will be small, um, can be isolated? Okay? So this is the first question. Second question, obviously, how heavy can I make a quantum system without losing the quantum properties? So these are our two questions. Okay? And um, basically, these are the questions we need to address. Well, it turns out, if you look in the landscape of experiments today, you can see um, here on the left side the quantum landscape, on the right side the gravity landscape, and this is uh, plotted against the mass of these um, uh, um, objects in such experiments. And uh, you can see that um, there's an extremely large gap between these two. And what we are trying to do now is essentially um, decrease this gap until we can do experiments um, of the type I just described. Okay? So, let's start with the gravity question. So, typical mass, if you perform a gravity experiment, typical masses to measure gravity as a coupling force between objects um, are normally, uh, typical masses are normally astronomical objects. Right? I mean, the Earth around the Sun, Moon around the Earth, and so on. Um, and when you do an Earth-bound experiment, this is typically kilogram-sized masses. So these are really like 10 centimeter aluminum, copper blocks, um, or whatsoever. Okay? So we wanted to know what challenges await us when we really get smaller and smaller with the mass. Okay? Will we still be able to isolate gravity or will other forces just Prevail. Okay, so the idea is simple. We take a mass 
a small one, like a little gold mass, a millimeter in size, and we move it periodically, and there's a second mass, and when we move the one periodically, we generate a gravitational field that changes in time and place, at the lo uh, in, in time, at the location of the second mass. So the second mass will also move, and um, we want to measure now the motion of the second mass as a consequence of the changing gravitational field of the first one. That's the idea, okay? Um, so the idea is very simple. Doing the measurement is <laughs> anything else but simple um, because, well, it's true. Gravity is the weakest force in the universe. Um, and this becomes particularly obvious when you try to measure it for very, very tiny masses. So to give you an idea of the numbers, okay? So um, the gravitational field of our gold sphere, so the gold sphere weighs 90 milligram. It's a one millimeter gold sphere. Yeah? And the, the gravitational field of, the, of this one millimeter sized object is 30 billion times smaller than the gravitational field, that, uh, the, the gravitational acceleration that we experience on Earth's um, surface. Okay? Um, or in, in, other, in, in other words, the expected deflection of the other sphere, so basically by how much does now the second mass move when I move the first one, it's a few nanometers. So it's a few millionths okay, of a millimeter that the other mass is going to move due to the gravitational acceleration produced by our one millimeter source mass. This is what we need to measure, and this is what we need to distinguish from many other effects. For example, traffic around our lab building. Yeah? How do we distinguish movement of the small mass due to the gravitational field or due to shaking of our experiment because a bus is passing by our lab? Okay? Um, cars, pedestrians, you name it. And even you need to think about the gravitational field that a 90-ton Vienna streetcar is uh, exerting on our experiment when it passes our lab in 70 meters distance. 90 tons is a lot. <laughs> and in 70 meters distance, it's, a, it's about the same gravitational force as the one millimeter object um, a millimeter away from our test mass. Okay. Um, so you can see here, for example, um, this was so, uh, the, the best time you can imagine was during the night to do the measurements. Right? So you see, this is a time trace of our measurements, and you see during the day everything is very noisy. Okay, and then. Uh, here it becomes less noisy. Yeah? And why? Well, this is because this is between midnight and 5 a.m., which is the time where you do your measurements. But you, you know, it's always the case. Yeah? Whenever you do measurements, you do it between midnight and 5 a.m. And you, you see here, these, these things here? This is the night bus. Okay? <laughs> and it's very much on time, yeah? <laughs> except, for, except for this one. You see? This is the only one that is delayed. Yeah? So it's sort of... Um, it's one of the most expensive traffic camps that was um, <laughs> developed in Vienna in the 21st century. Well, so, and the best time to measure, obviously, is Christmas. And so, um, during the Christmas vacation, we finally were able to complete the experiment, and we were able to measure the gravitational field of the smallest mass to date. The gravitational field was measured of, namely a one millimeter small gold sphere. Okay, so this is, by the way, this is equivalent to the mass of a ladybug. Yeah, just to, so, we, 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 in a, in a, so in a way, in a manner of speaking, we measure how a ladybug warps space-time. Okay, this is essentially the effect that we measure. And the, the accuracy of the experiment really exceeded our wildest expectations. Actually, the precision of the experiment. It corresponded to an acceleration sensitivity 13 orders of magnitude smaller than um, the acceleration of the surface of the Earth. Yeah, so it was really really nice. Now, um, currently we are preparing an experiment where we um, reduce the mass even further. Okay? So um, we want to reduce the mass now by another factor of 10,000 as a next step. And so for the experts among you, so this would be, here, yeah, this is the experiment we are planning for. That, um, uh, so this is currently the experiment, right, the mass, and now we want to replace it by this mass and we're going to measure the gravitational pull of that mass onto this large mass. Okay, that's like the moon pulling on the Earth, we can also measure that, right? And so we want to do that now in our uh, lab. And for the experts among you, 
So this mass that we have here, this corresponds to the, um, uh, the size of the Planck mass. So we're going to measure now the gravitational field um, of, uh, produced by an object the size of the Planck mass. Obviously, you cannot do that um, even with night buses. This is becoming impossible. So in order to minimize these influences, these experiments are currently being set up in an underground mine in the vicinity of Vienna. So we just um, had our first test measurements. It's the Conrad Observatory, and they are amazing. Yeah, so we see a reduction of the noise by almost a factor of 1,000. Everything is basically not moving at all. It's almost frightening, I have to say. Good. So um, let's, uh, we, I think we are in a good way to isolate gravity as a coupling force for very small objects. So let's go to the second task. Yeah, so what about um, quantum properties of such masses? Which brings me to um, another letter. Um, and this is the already mentioned letter from Schrodinger to Sommerfeld. So the one that I mentioned in um, announcing my talk. I read it to you. Actually, Schrodinger's handwriting was much worse than Einstein. So Einstein, you can actually read, and Schrodinger, you have to learn how to read it. Yeah. Um, so it starts with, for the German speaking among you, verehrter lieber Sommerfeld. So it's really, even though that is already hard to translate. It's like, dear, dearest Sommerfeld, something like that. First of all, may, um, you have my heartfelt thanks for your fifth edition. So obviously, we're sending him um, his, his book on, on atomic spectral lines. But you really spoil me with it more than cheaply and heap coals on my head, since I feel more and more distant from the time when I could return the many gifts I have received with a book of my own. After the introduction, now he starts. The basic question, the Grundlagenfrage in German, the basic question torments me more and more. And unfortunately, quite fruitlessly. May I prattle on a bit? So in German he says, Darf ich Ihnen ein bisschen vorschwätzen? And then he, then he makes this drawing. Um, and in this drawing you see it, um, it says schwerer Spiegel. It means heavy mirror on the left side. So here's the heavy mirror. And here's the photon. It says Lichtquant. And he discusses now in the following the situation, which is a very simple one, that if in the beginning you know the... Um, momentum of the mirror and the position of the photon source and you just let it go. You let the photon hit the mirror then, and, and then I ask the question, what happens? This is what he discusses um, in this letter and he realizes that these two objects, the photon and the mirror, they become correlated in a way that by just looking at the mirror, you can extract all the information of the photon. So this is why he says then in this letter, it seems that our mirror has now become a universal measurement tool. Yeah? Because momentum and position of the photon are imprinted on the mirror in such a way that both are registered with accuracies, the product of which can be pushed way below the limit of Planck's constant. This is now a side remark for the experts. What he's saying is that uh, the amount of information you can extract from looking at the other object is bounded by, uh, is not bounded anymore by Heisenberg's uncertainty. The conditional variances for the knowledge about position momentum violate Heisenberg's uncertainty. Um, it took another 50 years for a paper to appear where there's a formal derivation of this um, statement and quantifies this statement as a definition for entanglement. So uh, quantum correlations, a, a, a term also coined by Schrodinger in 1935. So four, four years before that, in 1931, he describes the phenomenon of quantum entanglement, quantifies it in such a way that only 50 years later, there's a paper who actually uh, does it in, in that way, just via intuition. This is really uh, uh, incredible. So, uh, but why am I showing you that? Well, the reason is that having now, you see, such a heavy object, he says schwerer Spiegel, heavy object, being quantum correlated with a photon means that you can use the photon. So he uses the mirror to learn something about the photon. But we can do it the other way around. We can use the photon to manipulate the mirror. Okay? Because they are quantum correlated. So I can now use my 
tools from quantum optics manipulate the light in order to manipulate the heavy mirror in the quantum machine. This is the whole idea. Okay? And so Schrodinger, in a way, already anticipated that for completely different reasons. Um, this letter was really about, again, the Grundlagenfrage, the fundamental question, uh, the exchange that he always had with, with all the people about um, what we can actually say about the world um, with quantum physics. But for us, it really led now to the insight that we can take such a heavy mirror, these heavy mirrors became a little bit lighter now in the course of the time, um, and light, this is why you have, um, uh, you see, the mirror is only this part now, so this is a micromechanical oscillator, just a little diving board on top of which uh, you have this highly reflective coating. And um, there you can shine light on. Light reflects, pushes this object, and if you do it right, you can have now quantum correlations between the two, the light and the mirror, and can in principle affecting, by doing measurements on the light, control now the motion of um, this object. So we had now already atoms, macromolecules, um, from which we know the quantum superpositions can be produced, but they are still 18 orders of magnitude away from our one millimeter gold sphere. So we need ways to go to larger masses. We need to put many atoms in a, in, in, in a, in a small volume. We need to go to these solid state objects. And um, uh, um, these quantum controlling them with light is the way to achieve that. And this is something where my team and I, um, more than 15 years ago now, started to uh, work on exactly this question, how we can control the motion of such solid state systems using um, quantum optical control techniques. And from this initial thoughts and experiments in collaboration with many, many other colleagues worldwide, this exciting field um, of quantum optomechanics has emerged. So this connection of optomechanical interactions, light exerts pressure with um, the quantum optical control techniques. And the basic idea is, is very simple. So um, you use the radiation pressure of light. Um, and with that, for example, even massive objects can be slowed down. Okay, so um, if you, photons reflect that if you manage to isolate now those photons that absorb kinetic energy of your object. So the photon carries away the energy and um, your oscillator has less, um, has less energy left. And so you can cool the motion exactly like people do with um, uh, laser cooling atoms. Um, they use exactly this principle. And so you can cool the center of mass motion to smaller and smaller temperatures until you reach the quantum machine. And so um, I, and basically this is now the principle of laser cooling applied to billions of atoms. Okay, in a in a in a in a in a degree, of, in a uh, um, in a um, no? in one um, a collective degree of freedom. And what you see here is just an example um, of the progress that we had. So we started out back in 2006. Um, again, you see this, this this little diving board with the mirror on top, and we shine light on it, and we use exactly this principle um, of having. Um, those collecting those photons more often that take away energy from the system in order to cool down. And what you see here is the number of, of motional quanta in the system. So basically, once you're below one, um, you, the motion of your object is dominated by the laws of quantum physics. And you see, originally, we couldn't cool that much. It took us several years until eventually um, we managed, in collaboration with these fantastic colleagues, to find um, sufficiently well-designed mechanical structures, sufficiently well-designed um, well optical experiments um, that the, the cooling rates, uh, extracting uh, energy using light, um, exceeded the heating rates in such a way that we could cool down into the quantum ground state. So and this is now essentially state of the art that um, one can engineer the motion of such solid objects in the quantum machine. About 10 years ago, then uh, the idea rose in our group to the, apply these methods that we have developed um, to the open question of gravity. Uh, I motivated that now long enough. So, um, but it became very quickly, very clear that having these diving boards just won't do the job. 
you know, because these diving boards are connected to the environment, so they, um, they may oscillate a little bit like um, they are supposed to do with quantum physics, but um, by no means would you have these long coherence times, this long time of quantum behavior that you would need, and this long uh, and this large separation of in the superposition that you would need in order to measure something with gravity. Yeah? So um, the question was for us now, how could we combine the advantages of the large mass of the solid state systems um, with the advantages of these very long coherence times and large superpositions that they have in atomic physics experiments, like with the atoms and the molecules that I showed to you. Um, where they have very large control over the quantum behavior of these, of these objects because they are in free fall. So these objects don't interact strongly with the environment. Yeah? So the question was how to combine these two, and the answer is amazingly simple. You cut the support of these diving boards and you simply levitate your solid state. Then you essentially have it in free fall. And um, as before, the motion of the object now that is levitated can easily be manipulated using these techniques um, with light that um, we have been using for the, for the clamped oscillator. Okay. Um, give, I want to give you two examples. So we are currently studying optically levitated glass spheres. So it is really tiny 150 nanometer um, glass spheres. Uh, this is about a factor of 10,000 times smaller um, than our gold spheres, yeah? or 12 orders of magnitude lighter than the gold spheres. So there's still a large gap. Yeah, but still, we need to start somewhere. So using a microscope, here you see on the, on the right the microscope objective, light is focused and it, the particle is trapped here. Um, we can now measure, with, with this microscope, we can measure the particle motion uh, with an accuracy that is limited only by quantum physics. So basically we are limited only by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in our accuracy of measuring position and momentum of this glass bead. It's a room temperature glass bead, and we can measure the, um, uh, the position and momentum with an accuracy given by Heisenberg's uncertainty, the principle. Yeah, that's called the Heisenberg limited measurements. So in other words, what we can do now is, and we can do that in real time, okay? So we can measure now in real time the quantum trajectory of a glass particle in a room temperature environment. And of course, when you can track the, um, uh, the, the, the quantum trajectory in real time, you can also feed back on it in real time and stabilize the, um, the, the glass sphere in its quantum ground state of motion. So we can now, just by real time feedback, applying real time feedback on the particle, we can uh, prepare now the motion, uh, that we can prepare now this particle in a state that is dominated, that whose motion is dominated by the laws of quantum physics. So it's in its quantum ground state of motion. So um, to, to, to give you a brief, um, of course, the, the situation is much more complex than just having a, a microscope objective and the particle. So basically, this is this, is this one, is the microscope objective and the particle. But what you actually need then, of course, um, you need some control theory, you need um, first, first of all, you need readouts here in the forward and the backward direction. Then um, you need some control theory, some Kalman filter, some optimal control um, in order to process the data and so on, come up with state space models. Um, and of course, you need um, fantastic people in the lab um, to do the job. In that case, uh, Lorenzo and Constanze. And here we teamed up, for example, with a team, with a group from. Um, the Technical University who specializes on control theory. Now, um, what you see here on the, on the right side is the image of our glass particle in its quantum ground state of motion in a room temperature environment. Okay? And you also see the difference between a black hole and a glass particle in its quantum state. Yeah? The one is green, the other is orange. Otherwise, they totally look the same. <laughs> so um, now, if one does not want to or cannot uh, read out so precisely as we did with our microscope, yeah, then there are other tricks. You can use an optical cavity. So basically, you have the particle between two mirrors, um, and that is also sufficient. So that cavity helps us to scatter um, only those photons into the resonator and along the axis of the resonator 
um, that take away energy from the glass bead. So it is exa exactly the same, the same picture again. So for, for the atomic physics people among you, um, the, the, the right way of saying that, so this is an inelastic Raman scattering process, and the cavity is tuned into resonance with the anti-Stokes scattering um, the part of the, of the Raman scattering in such a way that now only those photons are scattered that take away energy from the particle motion and cool down the particle. And um, also here in this configuration, we were able to cool down the motion of the particle in its quantum ground state of motion um, approximately two years ago. Now, um, the big challenge for the coming years now is to develop methods to transform this already established quantum motion into a superposition. Okay? So this is basically um, what we now want to make here is the next step. We have the particle in the quantum state. Now we want to sort of make this superposition okay, um, to let it, literally speaking, then fly through a double slit, so to speak. Okay? And uh, the whole thing then with a mass heavy enough to find out whether gravitational field is subject to the laws of physics. Uh, this would be the plan. To essentially now create a situation in which we have, could have, uh, the question is whether nature is going to allow us to, uh, will allow uh, us to do that, a superposition of two possible metrics of space-time. Okay, I conclude. More than 60 years ago, I already mentioned the quote by Feynman, more than 60 years ago, the leaders in the field of gravitational physics, they met in, in Chapel Hill. So there was a new center to be founded um, with Bryce and Cecile de Witt. And uh, to the, uh, they met there to discuss the future of their field of gravitational physics. And in the end of that conference, there were essentially two questions of experimental character. Eh? Do gravitational waves exist? And does gravity require a quantum description? So for the first question, we already have a positive experimental answer, essentially 60 years after it was uh, phrased at this conference. Yeah? And on the second question, I claim that we are at least well on our way. We are still far out, but um, I, I think it's fair to say that thanks to these breathtaking developments over the last um, uh, decade in the control of solid state massive quantum systems um, which is the basis by the way for today's quantum technologies we have left the level of thought experiments and we know now what needs to be done to get us closer to answering this question we have gained quantum control over solids weighing, uh, containing billions of atoms and we will soon be able to determine the gravitational field of a mass the size of the Planck mass. Okay? I mean, for me, this is a fantastic example how basic research and technology development go hand in hand. Without these great advances in the development of these technologies, we would not have now the ability to study these very, very fundamental questions. Um, and it's also very fascinating to envision what the next... 60 years will bring. So, in a way, again, I showed you, in order to do that, we have to close this gap between the quantum and the gravity world. So we need to close it, we need to bring it together, and even more together. So this is now where our experiments need to take place until they finally overlap and will allow us to do these experiments. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, so we haven't seen that. Um, 
we by no means can I claim that ours was a um, precision experiment in the sense that um, we would have been sensitive to it. Um, however, there are conjectures, in particular um, some quantum theories of gravity um, that would expect a deviation. So th we haven't seen any and um, uh, by now no experiment has seen it. Um, so we don't know. But if Again, quantum, if some quantum theories of gravity would be correct, like string theory, you would expect a breakdown. Hmm. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, okay. So the question was, um, is there any uh, estimate on how long it would take to develop a consistent theory between that sort of unites quantum theory and uh, gravity? And uh, string theory was, was mentioned as an explicit example. Uh, so obviously, I, I cannot give you, a, I cannot give you a, a, um, a serious answer to that. Um, the, the, I, I guess the question is, is it going to be a straightforward way? So right now, um, people are using concepts that sort of generalize what we already know, uh, obviously also based on simply all the experimental facts that we have. And there, as I said, there's nothing new yet, really. So um, what I hope for, personally, is that there's some surprise out there yeah, that will um, then result in a theory that needs to be designed that completely throws aboard um, uh, concepts that we think that we need to hold fast. This, this would be my personal um, ideal situation. But I could not tell you, of course, where, where I would expect the, the surprises. Yeah. But I'm, I'm positive. Something is going to happen, definitely. Yeah, and I definitely hope in, in our lifetime. Yeah. So um, we have right now on the, so at, at the moment, so from the experiments that exist, okay, um, the masses still differ um, between the left side of quantum experiments, where we have suppositions, and the right side of gravity experiments, the masses still differ by 12 orders of magnitude, yeah, which is a lot. Uh, on the other hand, um, I already said that the next thing that we want to do is we want to push for at least, uh, at least uh, three to four orders of magnitude on the gravity side. Okay? So then we only down eight orders of magnitude. Right? We only need eight orders of magnitude. Um, we, we also have experiments now going where instead of optically levitating a glass particle with 100 nanometer, we are magnetically levitating a superconductor with a few micrometer inside. So suddenly, you see, you gain another six orders of magnitude in mass. Yeah? And so from eight, you're down to two orders of magnitude. So, yeah. so right now, 12. But I think um, there's at least a not completely um, uh, unimaginative, uh, unintuitive way of closing uh, this gap. But it hasn't been done yet. Okay? So I think this is now really well. And we need ideas. So this is, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm really super happy that we have such a young audience um, because uh, we need ideas on the theory side how to actually create these large superpositions. Yeah, this is, this is a, uh, and also on the experimental side. This is non-trivial. Yeah, it's one thing to have a, an atom through a double slit, but um, manipulating such a large particle, you need new methods. Sorry. So, so sorry, this I didn't say again. Oh, I see, I see.
use biomolecules. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, I see, I see. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, so, here, we, we, we are here, no? So, basically, okay. Um, so, the question is, can we use biomolecules here instead of... Yeah, exactly. So, something uh, which would be, of course, much, much less heavy, right? Um, so, for the gravity experiment, it wouldn't make sense um, to, to, to use them because um, in order to... Uh, uh, measure gravity, you need many, many atoms. So you would like to increase the number of atoms in a volume. However, but if, you want to do, if you want to do different experiments, um, that's, a, that, that's another topic. And there the answer is in principle yes. Um, you see, the, the question is um, how strong can you keep an object? And um, the, the reason why this particle is kept in this optical tweezer is that it's polarizable. So um, if you apply an electric field to a polarizable object, right, um, then basically, you, you know, you have a dipole, and the potential landscape that the particle sees is simply the dipole moment times the electric field, uh, d times z, right? That's the, that's the potential landscape. Now, if the dipole um, that is being used there is induced by the external field, Okay, then your dipole is just alpha, the polarizability, times the electric field. No? I mean, if, you're, um, so if, if the overall potential that your particle sees um, is something like um, minus d e times e, right? and this is now, this is now an external uh, an, an induced dipole, um, which is simply the polarizability times the, times the external field. You see, then the potential that the particle sees is simply minus alpha times e squared, okay? which is the intensity. Okay? So basically, the, the, the trap that the, that the light is doing is given by the intensity and the polarizability. And the problem is now, if I take less and less atoms, like in a, in a molecule, in a, in a protein, then the polarizability goes down. So it might be, this one needs to, simply needs to see that um, this alpha just becomes too small, or you would need too much intensity, given a very small dipole moment, as a small polarizability, and you just burn the whole thing. Okay, so this is something one needs to. But I mean, in liquids, this is done already. Yeah, this is like uh, uh, this is one of the reasons Ashkin got the Nobel Prize for developing um, exactly this type of um, uh, methods because it is used so much now in medical physics. You can manipulate cells in liquids and so on just using these optical forces. Okay, I'm answering faster now. <laughs> uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, I think as, as a biologist, I think I understood just enough to formulate this question. Uh -huh. That's good. Um, so for a beginning, your gold sphere experiment, uh, to reduce the noise, you have to go really far underground, yeah? <laughs> Would the Earth, or the, I guess the core of the Earth and the movement in that cause fluctuations or if we ever would bump into this limitation, I would be so glad. <laughs> <This is laughs> uh, in principle, definitely. Okay? In principle, everything that moves will be a problem. I mean, uh, weather is a problem huh? because the density, if density changes, if, there's a, if there are clouds forming and so on, if density changes, yeah, that basically change the gravitational uh, potential at the location of the experiment. Right? Um, so the mine that we have here is um, not much underground. It is actually uh, drilled, it's, it's a mine shaft drilled into a mountain. Uh, it's basically, um, you just try to have a very uh, let's say a large solid environment around um, to isolate yourself from seismic. This is the, this is the most um, uh, important one and the, 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 it's always a question of to, at which frequencies are you sensitive. So in our case we performed the experiment at frequencies of a few millihertz um, so basically one oscillation or few oscillations per thousand seconds um, which is uh, basically um, It's 
yeah, per, uh, uh, per hundred seconds in our case, so 10 minutes approximately, which is, which is then exactly this, this time scales for the, um, for the seismic of pedestrians, cars, and so on. Okay, so tides, for example, they will also have an effect, but on other time scales. Okay, so it, it always depends, basically you, you tr try to pick, which is, uh, this is one of the nice features of these experiments, uh, you try to be very selective to a special frequency, which helps you then to isolate the effect again. Uh, if I would have to do it at any frequency, I would be much worse off. Thank you. Hmm. So the question was, um, if at some point, um, if we reduce the mass further, we would not see any gravitational effect anymore, could this be um, a hint that uh, gravity is an, an, an emergent um, force, like an entropic force, for example, as um, Verlinde was suggesting? Um, well, yeah, I think so. Possibly this, this could be one possible explanation. So I'd say if really everything else um, uh, fails to explain this is effect, my understanding of this entropic force is a little bit of a different one. It's a thermodynamic phenomenon, so it would never actually vanish. So in, in this approach, in the approach of an entropic force, it would never totally vanish, but it would depend on, for example, the entropy of the gravitational field. So it would make a difference if I do it at high or low temperatures, yeah, in, a, in a way, or in an accelerated or non-accelerated frame. Um, yeah. There are also other ones, yes, yes. The, the, the ones that I know in this regime just now, uh, I apologize for being a little te technical here, the ones that I know where it vanishes, it would vanish then on time scales given by the Planck time. Um, so it would never also it would never go off completely all the time, but it would be then um, it would be uh, broken into a piece of the Planck time. But in principle, yes, I agree. That would be very fascinating. Uh, that would be so cool actually <laughs> to see that. Aha, for the future. Uh, also, like, how are you done already? Oh, no, with this one, um, this is a pure quantum experiment. So in, in, this, uh, in this case, um, this experiment um, uh, shows that we can use methods of quantum control, quantum optical control, to prepare such a glass bead in a quantum state. Okay? The particle itself is still way too small and too light to produce a measurable gravitational field, unfortunately. But the hope is that we can now use these techniques that we have developed, namely reading it out at the Heisenberg limit, using this information to process it in a, in a, in a really uh, well, in a um, so-called Kalman filter where we know um, the, the state space with a good model and then we can use this for feedback, doing an optimal feedback on the position, that we can apply these methods also now to larger particles. For example, um, the, the ones so where we do magnetic instead of optic levitation, where we have a magnetically trapped particle that we can also read now, out now via induction, so we have a, a little coil uh, uh, in the vicinity of which the particle moves. It changes the magnetic flux through the coil, and that is essentially our microscope that contains now the readout of this coil, contains information about the position, and this we could in principle now use again for feeding back and preparing it in the quantum state. And then if it's so large, then in principle this could be the particle which could source the gravitational field, and then we have another particle that could measure it. But I have not told you yet um, how to go from this particle in the ground state to the situation 
um, where we have the particle actually then in a superposition, yeah, where we then really have um, a situation where the glass particle goes the upper and the lower state. This is also for us now the big question how to realize that with the glass particle instead of the macromolecule. Definitely. So the, the question was um, if we could use techniques um, possibly developed also for other fields. Um, uh, for example, let's say uh, all the gravity measurements where noise cancelling is a big thing, not only here in the black hole image, also in the gravitational wave detection where you need to cancel seismic noise actually. So could we use those uh, techniques um, for our experiments to improve? And the, the answer is definitely yes. So um, in, in, in several cases. So um, first of all, um, already here, that, um, this, this real-time measurement and feedback control is a really, really um, delicate thing. So you need super fast electronics. You need super fast FPGA boards that do the job here. Um, you need extremely good um, uh, noise characterization of your setup and so on and so on. And for the gravity experiment, we rely a lot um, on the experience of our colleagues uh, from the gravitational wave community that isolate, you know, all the large masses from the seismic um, influences of the environment. Mm -hmm. So d definitely, yes. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you, think that you have cooled your experiment down to your flat ball or whatever, and you go weird down to the roots of the tunnels of the waves, and I think there are Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so the question was, um, I, I, I told you uh, during my presentation that what we have done is we had um, controlled the center of mass degree of freedom of the glass object in such a way that it is described by the laws of quantum physics. So we have the center of mass motion, the center of mass degree of freedom of the object in its quantum ground state. But I also told you um, this is in a room temperature environment. So the question is how relevant is the actual internal temperature of the object? So in sort of uh, loosely speaking, the, the, the temperature of the electrons in a way, right, of the solid. Um, and <laughs> so the, the, the internal temperature of this object is even larger than room temperature. Right, because we, we trap it with a laser, the thing absorbs light, it heats up. This thing is like 500 or 600 Kelvin hot. Okay, while it sits in its quantum ground state of motion. So does this hurt us? Oh yes, of course it hurts us, why? Um, the whole thing about quantum coherence or about showing quantum properties is that you must not lose any information to the environment. Okay? Many people of you might, might have, may, may have read um, the article of Schrodinger about Schrodinger's cat. Okay? Why is the cat in a box? The box is a symbol for being completely isolated from the world. This is exactly what you need for a quantum experiment. Only the, the environment must never learn um, about the state of my object. Only then can I have quantum uh, features. Okay? And now, if my glass sphere here is hot, yes, it will emit radiation, black body radiation. This thing is like, <laughs> it's just radiating out its position information. Yeah? Like hell, this is like, uh, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah? Like, right? So, um, and this, this is what limits the coherence time at the moment. So um, this is why either 
so what you, I mean, there are also in our methods, you can use lasers um, and you have some additional atoms, um, or defects in, in this thing, and you can actually laser cool even the internal temperature. This could be one way. The other way is, like, um, as I said, we are right now so levitating superconductors, and they are, and this is so nice, they levitate in a magnetic field at 20 millikelvin. Problem solved. Uh, the only thing that I don't have yet is quantum control. So somehow, um, yeah, I hope. And so what's your idea for an effective beam splitter then? Like for, for, for getting the superposition? Or, I mean, do you have some, you're not going to tell me. But... No, 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 I can tell you. I can tell you. It's just a matter of time now. No, so there are ideas. There are different ones um, from um, conditional state preparations. And we have published some of them. So this is all, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not... I don't have secrets anyways. No, I, I always think it's better to, to just spit it out and get good feedback and then something interesting will emerge from that. Um, so, uh, you, so for example, as conditional state control, you can couple your system um, to a nonlinearity. So for example, to a qubit. Yeah, this would be another, another way of creating that. Uh, and right now, paper in preparation, stay tuned. Um, you can also do it via some diffraction methods. So basically trying to create some diffraction pattern. Um, and then basically in the diffraction pattern, um, you, the, 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 the object would then go uh, several ways at the same time, yeah? like they did, for example, in this neutron experiment. Yeah, they diffract, and then you have a superposition of the neutron being in one arm or the other arm. I think there was still one, two. Yeah. Same, it was really hard to understand. I understood the one then. What's the application of a, of a, a merging of quantum gravity, uh, of, of some mechanical gravity? That was the question? Yeah. What's next? What's next after theory and quantum gravity? Well, then we make a long holiday. <laughs> 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 and we, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so in Bavaria, there's this beautiful story about this uh, arch, arch, an, archangel. Is that, a, is that the right word? Archangel Aloysius. Uh, he's a Bavarian. Um, he's a Bavarian uh, um, uh, Beamter. How is it? He's a, a government employee. Bavarian government employee uh, who dies and just goes to heaven, and then he just uh, happily lives ever after there with um, basically doing the very same up there which he did um, down on earth, eh? going to the beer garden and having just one pint after the other. <laughs> <laughs> we have one at the back, I think first and we'll take it afterwards and let us stop here and ask one, okay? So back first and then. Say that again. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, the, the question was, do I have a preferred interpretation of quantum mechanics? Um, so I, well, I'm pretty sure it sort of um, already showed throughout my, my talk and the fact that I essentially come from Vienna. Uh, so um, we, we are, um, we, we, I think in, in Vienna the, there's a prevailing opinion that um, uh, physics is um, to, no, not to say, um, say something, make a statement about how nature is, but um, to make a statement about what we can say about nature. Uh, and that already tells you that in a very, very abstract way, um, quantum physics, um, in the way Schrödinger actually um, formulated it, in particular in this beautiful 1935 paper we introduced entanglement, is about um, information, is about um, what we can say about what we can say. So it's a, in a, in a, it's in a um, loosely speaking, a, a formalized theory of knowledge. Yeah? So this goes very much into the spirit of what has been discussed between Bohr, Schrödinger, and others. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's a first step, okay? So I personally, um, I personally, because of what I just said, so thank you very much for the follow-up question, um, I personally uh, believe that um, we won't see any surprises at this level. But, uh, of course, I'm... I'm always be prepared to be surprised by nature. I, mean, I would be super happy to be surprised. Um, I, my expectation is not being surprised and just seeing quantum um, physics prevail uh, and us having really to adapt our notions um, of space-time. Um, but on the other hand, this is of course just the first step. Okay? So um, such an experiment um, would only be the sort of first level of excitement. So I call it the, the, the first level of excitement on the Dwali scale. And because Gia Dwali and I had a, the discussion a couple of years ago at a conference, and I, after many, many uh, long discussions, so I, I tried to, I, I sort of figured out that I get him more and more excited so the, the, by, by, by adding more and more things on the experiment. And so the first level of excitement on the Dwali scale was what I just showed you, like a static gravitational field in superposition. The second level of excitement was when I add the fact that the gravitational field actually propagates, yeah, that it's not just a static force, but that it's something that moves yeah, because it's a field, so the, the interaction propagates. That's the same. And, and then uh, you already are at the level of fields, so not only static fields, but of propagating fields, so that it makes a difference then from the, from the theory point of view. And then the third level of excitement um, would be if the field degree of freedom itself would also get involved. Yeah, so that like the, the field acts then as a third party um, that, would get, that would get involved and um, th this would mean that gravitons also have to exist. So, um, but, but this is even more foul. I can tell you in, what was it, 25th lecture? The 50th Schrodinger lecture, I will, I will tell you about the possibilities there. I, I, I wouldn't even know right now how to do that. by Richard Helsham. It's a reprint by a book that was published in, just to get the date right, uh, 1738. Richard Helsham was the first professor of natural and experimental philosophy here at Trinity College Dublin. This is considered the first physics textbook in the English language. And so, as I said, it's reprinted from the original, which is on my desk in my office. This book, it's an important thing. You I was told recently by an undergrad that undergrads don't read textbooks anymore, but anyway, <laughs> textbooks are apparently important, so this is an, an interesting thing. But this book was lost for a long time. There were no copies of the first physics textbook in the English language. A historian of science, his name was Norman Macmillan, decided there must be a copy somewhere and dedicated his life to looking in old second-hand bookshops in Dublin and eventually found one which he donated Seriously. to the School of <laughs> Physics, and it, this was copied from it. There is a Vienna connection, because when the English copy was lost, the only remaining copy was a copy in Latin from uh, 1767 that was printed in Vienna. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.